What is going on, wonderful people? It's Medicosis Perfectionaris, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my neurology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about strokes, ischemic and hemorrhagic. We talked about the Glasgow Coma Scale. We talked about neurogenic shock and the other types of shock. We talked about Guillain-Barre syndrome. We talked about multiple sclerosis. We discussed myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. We also talked about Duchenne muscular dystrophy and Becker's muscular dystrophy. Today, it's time to talk about the pressure inside your skull or your intracranial pressure. What happens if it's too high? It's called intracranial hypertension. What are the causes of high intracranial pressure? What are the consequences of intracranial hypertension? Let's find out. Click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. On these topics, I have two main playlists. One is called neuroanatomy for the anatomy stuff. And one is called neurology, which has everything. It has anatomy, it has physiology, it has pathology, it has pharmacology, it has everything you can imagine. And of course, internal medicine and surgery topics. Back to basics. These facts are so basic that the pH is starting to rise. What is pressure? It's force over surface area. And that's why the pros can sleep and put a big load on their chest without the nails piercing their body. Why not? Because I distributed the large force over a very large surface area of all of these nails, so therefore the pressure is low. So therefore, the load is not gonna pierce me. Pressure is force over area, and force is mass times gravitational caused by gravity, or G. G for physicists is not the same as G for psychologists. G in psychology or neuroscience is something else. If you know what I'm talking about, comment below. Look at this, it's the same mass, so 100 kilograms and 100 kilograms. Of course, G never changes because it's caused by the same gravity, so there's no difference here. The only difference is in A. The surface area is huge, but the surface area is tiny. So therefore, which one is exerting a higher pressure? The answer is B. Why higher pressure? Because the surface area is smaller. Look at this equation. If the surface area is smaller, the pressure is higher, provided that the force remains constant. Now, since doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, paramedics, and lab scientists suck at physics, we're gonna ignore the angle and focus on the force and the area only. But of course, the angle can make you or break you. For example, if you're trying to clean the window with a towel, it's extremely unlikely that you'll be able to break the glass this way. However, one punch from you to this glass can destroy it and shatter it into smithereens. What's the difference? It's all about the angle. To learn more about this topic, check out my physics playlist. Why do you think big trucks have wide tires? Because if you increase the surface area, what's gonna happen to the pressure? The pressure will decrease so that the big truck does not sink in the sand. For the same reason, big trucks have more tires, also more surface area. More surface area equals lower pressure so that the truck does not sink in the sand. This is your brain from the outside. This is your cerebral cortex, which is part of the forebrain. The midbrain is hidden right about here. After this, we have the pons and the medulla, behind which is their cerebellum. But let's cut through this and dig deeper. You will find something like this. You have the ventricles. You have two lateral ventricles. Here is just one of them. And then there is a foramen of Monroe. It is way narrower than this, of course, which will lead you into the third ventricle. After the third ventricle, there is the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius, which passes in the midst of the midbrain. Then you have the fourth ventricle, and then some of that cerebrospinal fluid will flow from the fourth ventricle to the central canal of the spinal cord. The rest of the CSF will escape through the foramen of Mijandi and the two foramina of Loschke into the subarachnoid space, which will surround the brain and your spinal cord. Where is the subarachnoid space? It's under the arachnoid mater, but above the pia mater. These are meninges. And then we will have to drain the cerebrospinal fluid via arachnoid granulations into 
big sinuses, such as the superior sagittal sinus. A sinus will lead to another sinus, another sinus, until you end up in the internal jugular vein. Internal jugular vein shall combine with the subclavian vein to form brachiocephalic vein. Brachiocephalic from the right will join with brachiocephalic from the left to give me one superior vena cava, which will end up in your right atrium. So the CSF came from blood vessels. Which blood vessels are we talking about? We're talking about the ependymal cells that line the choroid plexus. Plexus of what? Plexus of capillaries, vessels. And this is the thing that makes the CSF. So the CSF came from blood and is returned back to blood. What does that remind you of? It reminds me of lymph, which came from arterial blood and was returned to venous blood. If you wish to see more videos like this in the future, please drop a brain emoji in the comments. Let's take a look at a coronal section. These are lateral ventricles, right and left, and then they lead into the third ventricle. Cerebral aqueduct will take me to the fourth ventricle. And then you can continue downstairs to become the central canal of the spinal cord. Or you can escape via the foramen of Mijandi and the foramen of Lushke to surround the brain and the spinal cord in the subarachnoid space. Each part of the brain has its own cavity. What's the name of the cavity of the telencephalon? We call them lateral ventricles. What's the name of the cavity of the diencephalon? It's the third ventricle. What's the name of the cavity of the mesencephalon? It's not a ventricle, but it's an aqueduct. It's the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. And what's the name of the cavity of the hind brain? It's the fourth ventricle. By the way, for more quick reviews like this, go to my anatomy playlist. You will find two videos to review, anatomy of the head, two for the neck, two for the thorax, two for the abdomen, two videos for the pelvis, same for the upper extremities and lower extremities. I also have neuroanatomy review and embryology review videos. And soon in another playlist called in 90 minutes, there will be cardiology in 90 minutes, neurology in 90 minutes, rheumatology in 90 minutes, endocrinology in 90 minutes, physiology in 90 minutes, etc. So after the CSF leaves the ventricles, it goes to the subarachnoid space, which surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, then to the arachnoid granulation, and then to the superior sagittal sinus, among others. And then the superior sagittal sinus will take you to the transverse sinus on the right side. After the transverse sinus, there is sigmoid sinus. Why do we call it sigmoid? Because it looks like a Greek sigma letter. It is bendy. After this, we are in the internal jugular vein, then brachiocephalic vein, then superior vena cava, then your heart. If you want to learn about the subarachnoid cisterns, see my neuroanatomy playlist. There is a video titled Cerebrospinal Fluid. If you want to download these notes, go to medicosisperfectionaries.com. I help you learn, understand, and pass exams. If you want me to personally tutor you, reach out to me on my website. So pressure is force over area, okay? How can we measure the intracranial pressure or the pressure inside your cranium or inside your skull? We can do it through lumbar puncture. How does that work? you puncture the lumbar. And of course, we're not puncturing the spinal cord. Not if you're a good doctor. You try to puncture below the cord in order not to injure the cord. For all the anatomy connoisseurs out there, you shall recall that the spinal cord ends about between L1 and L2. So therefore, to keep the spinal cord alive, keep your needle between L3 and 5, which is below L1 and L2, to keep the spinal cord safe. And then you connect your needle to a manometer, which can measure pressure. The pressure in this CSF, in the subarachnoid space of the lumbar area, is roughly equal to your intracranial pressure. Because remember, the brain is continuous with the spinal cord, and the meninges that cover the brain are continuous with the meninges that cover the spinal cord, and the subarachnoid space of the brain is continuous with the subarachnoid space of the spinal cord. Of course, we do this test when the patient is supine, not upright, because uh, physics. What is the normal intracranial pressure? It's between 7 and 13 millimeters of mercury in adults. In infants or neonates, it's usually lower. Can we convert millimeters of mercury into millimeters of water? Easy. And this requires you to go back to physics and remember that the density for water is what? It was a thousand. 
a thousand what? A thousand grams per liters. And what was the density of mercury, please? The density of mercury was not a thousand, but 13,600. So we can say that the density of mercury is greater than water. Greater by how much? The density of mercury is 13.6 times that of water. So you simply multiply the 7 by 13.6, you get something close to 100. And you multiply the 13 by 13.6, you get something close to 180. So therefore, the normal intracranial pressure is between 100 and 180 millimeters of water. Next, a very important test, which is known as Quinkenstedt test. Why do we use it? To assess whether the CSF obstruction is there or not. If there is an obstruction, this is abnormal. If there is no obstruction and everything is communicating, this is normal. How do I do this? Remember that the CSF eventually drains into the jugulars. So if you compress the jugulars, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, I compress the jugulars. The pressure will rise here, 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 here. The pressure will rise in the cerebrospinal fluid. Since the cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, you will find on the lumbar tap that's connected to the manometer that the intracranial pressure rises or the lumbar CSF pressure rises when you compress the jugular veins for 10 seconds. Then I want you to release the compression you will find that the pressure drops back to normal. If it increases when you compress and drops when you decompress, this person is normal and this is a negative test. Otherwise, it's a positive test and the patient probably has an obstruction. Next, the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis. What is this? It states basically that your skull is like a box that is 100% full. It is packed and stacked and stuffed. There is not a single inch of empty space inside the skull. And therefore, anything that appears within the skull, e.g. a tumor, has to raise the intracranial pressure. Otherwise, herniation will occur. Something has to give. So, space occupying lesion, for example, a tumor or a brain abscess can raise the intracranial pressure. Raising the intracranial pressure increases the risk of herniation because the high pressure causes pushing. You push part of the brain outside. If you want to learn more about herniation, I have a special video on brain herniation in my neurology playlist. This high intracranial pressure is going to decrease the cerebral perfusion pressure. What does that mean? Let's think that this is an artery, for example, a vertebral artery, going up to supply your brain. It has a pressure inside it. However, if the intracranial pressure is so high, it will compress the poor vertebral artery and squeeze it and suffocate it. So what's going to happen to the perfusion pressure that's going to the brain? Of course, it's going to decrease. And this is called decreased cerebral perfusion pressure because you are compressing the artery and compressing the artery and compressing the artery. Also, anytime there is intracranial hypertension, Cushing reflex can happen, especially if you press on the brain stem. To learn more about Cushing reflex, I have a separate video on this topic in my neurology playlist. So what are the causes of intracranial hypertension and what are the consequences of intracranial hypertension? The causes include idiopathic intracranial hypertension, also known as benign intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. Brain abscess, that's a space-occupying lesion. Hematoma inside the cranium, that's a space-occupying lesion. Brain tumor, that's a space-occupying lesion. Aneurysm, a space-occupying lesion. High CSF, this is hydrocephalus. And I have a separate video on hydrocephalus on this channel. Increased venous pressure because I have congestive heart failure. Think of it this way. This is an artery, and this artery supplies your brain. And then there is a vein that drains your brain like this and this vein is connected to the right side of the heart. Okay, if I have congestive heart failure, this heart cannot receive blood because it cannot pump. So the blood is piling up and piling up and piling up and accumulating. So these veins will get bigger, they will get congested. And when they get congested, what's going to happen? You will back up, back up, back up and affect the brain. So now the brain is having high intracranial pressure because of poor heart performance. To learn more about congestive heart failure, see my cardiology playlist. Metabolic disorders such as hepatic encephalopathy from hyperammonemia that is damaging to the brain, as well as hyponatremia because sodium problems can lead to CNS problems. Epilepsy seizures can also raise the intracranial pressure. If the intracranial pressure is high, what's going to happen? 
Macrocephaly if I'm an infant because the sutures of the skull have not fused yet. So if the pressure goes up, it will expand the size of my skull. These babies have very big heads. Headache, but not any headache. It's a special type of headache. It's frontal headache that gets worse when you lean forwards and it's worse in the morning. Vomiting, but not any type of vomiting. Projectile vomiting, papilledema and blurry vision, increased opening pressure on lumbar puncture, altered consciousness, abnormal gait, midline shift on neuroimaging, and sometimes abducens nerve palsy. Why the abducens? Why do you pick on the abducens? You have 12 cranial nerves. Why do you decide to damage the abducens? The answer to this question is in my abducens nerve video in my neuroanatomy playlist. Intracranial pressure that affects the brainstem can lead to Cushing reflex, which is a triad of hypertension, bradycardia, irregular breathing. If you want to learn about the treatment of intracranial hypertension, please check out my hydrocephalus video, which you can find in this neurology playlist. Let me tell you something. If you suspect a space-occupying lesion, like a brain tumor, especially if it's big or located in a critical area, anatomically speaking, please do not perform a lumbar puncture. What's going to happen if I perform it? The moment you perform lumbar puncture, you are withdrawing fluid. When you withdraw fluid from the lumbar area around the spinal cord, you're going to decrease the pressure around the spinal cord. But this patient has a tumor in the brain, so the pressure upstairs is very high. Now the pressure in the brain is very high, but you, as a doofus, is lowering the blood pressure downstairs. You are creating a very significant delta P, pressure difference between upstairs and downstairs. You know what's going to happen? Something from upstairs will herniate and bulge downstairs. This could be your brain stem, which contains the respiratory center and the cardiovascular center. Now your patient will turn into a piece of vegetable. Hashtag vegetative state. This means that you are a complete doofus, which makes you liable for all the damages that happen next. Also, if you suspect a space-occupying lesion, such as a brain tumor, do not perform the Quickenstead test. Otherwise, by compressing and decompressing the jugular veins, you're messing around with the pressure gradient, which can lead to brain herniation. Don't do it. And let me tell you something. If you suspect any brain-occupying mass, if you're not sure if the patient has a mass in the brain or not, do a CT scan or MRI first. Then you do the lumbar puncture. And in many hospitals, it is routine to do a CT scan or MRI before the lumbar puncture to make sure that this disaster does not happen. I mean, the last thing that you need as a patient is for your brain to be pooping out. Make sure to watch my video on brain herniation, my video on the abducens nerve, and my video on hydrocephalus. Don't forget to take a look at my neuroanatomy playlist. And if you want neuropharmacology, like anti-epileptics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, anti-Parkinsonian, opiates, anesthetics, stimulants, sedatives, and hypnotics, this neuropharmacology course will teach you about all of these topics. Go to medicosisperfectionalis.com to download it today. It comes with videos, notes, and cases. To learn about the adrenergics, the cholinergics, the muscarinics, the nicotinics, and all of that lovely stuff, download my autonomic pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. You'll understand physiology better, and you'll understand pharmacology better, and you will become a better doctor. To learn about strokes, myocardial infarctions, cardiac arrhythmias, ARDS, acute limb ischemia, drowning, all the toxic drones that you can think of, download my emergency medicine high yields course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. There is also a surgery high yields course. Help me make more videos by supporting my channel. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash medicosis. There are more than 600 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine, chemistry, math, and physics make perfect sense.